Hello and welcome to Move and Expel It. I'm your host, Dave Lindsay, and joining me today on Google Hangout is Mr. Liam O'Leary. Sup, diggity. Not much, sir. Not <laughs> up at all. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. <laughs> middle of yeah. June. You know what happens on Tuesday? Not a damn thing. Not true. It's new release day. Um, That's true. And I think we had like 300 Rise of an Empire, which I saw in theaters, and it was fun. But it's that typical sequel that came out about five years too late after the original one and just doesn't hold a candle to it. It just, you know. Ghostbusters 2, it is not. You know, Ghostbusters <laughs> 2 came out. I think Ghostbusters yeah. The original one, I believe, is it was a uh, well, yeah, it was '84 because it's Ghostbusters is celebrating its 30-year anniversary this year. Um, I think it just passed the official anniversary the other week when it was first released in theaters. Um, it's getting a re-release in IMAX in late August, and then a new special edition Blu-ray with unseen behind-the-scenes stuff and. <laughs> it's just um, time to get coffee. But yeah, but Ghostbusters 2 came out five years. I believe that was 89. Yep. Um, it, I mean, I won't say it is quite as good as the original, but it's not a disappointment. No. Where it's a fun movie. 300 Rising of Empire was kind of like, eh, it was enjoyable, but I did not rush out to uh, Best Buy or Target or anywhere that Target. sells... Uh, movies to pick it up. Um, but speaking of Ghostbusters, real quick, but uh, since it is celebrating its 30th anniversary, what's like, what's your favorite like Ghostbusters memory you have? Ghostbusters is probably one of the first movies that uh, my family had. I mean, my family had other movies on tape. But, like, I learned how to use the VCR by watching Ghostbusters. Right. And I remember being a little, little kid. Popping in the VCR and just just spending, just spending a couple hours sitting there watching that with my brothers. And that was just a normal thing for us. Like, you know what? Boom. It would be Star Wars and Ghostbusters for the most part. Let's go. Just pop it in and you're watching Ghostbusters. And it was awesome. It it's was. still awesome. Yep. Yeah, I think that was, like, for me, like, my first, like, fantasy. Like, beyond, like, fantasy of being Superman, or which every kid probably did. And I, I have my own uh, trying to be Superman story. But, like, I, I remember my running pack. around with the, with the proton pack, the, the plastic proton pack, and my dad had a little uh, Michelin man, which was my Stay Puft Marshmallow man. He's a perfect facsimile. And, like, before I even had the... the, the the actual plastic proton pack, my dad took, like, one of his uh, bicycle backpacks, stuffed it with towels, and then took the old, an old vacuum hose, and I had, like, a makeshift proton pack, which, you know what, for a three-year-old is enough. Oh, yeah. The imagination does the rest. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I eventually did get the, you know, the plastic proton pack with the trap, you know, um, yeah, that was that came out thirty years, and we'll definitely have to do like a podcast specifically on that. Um, we also hit a milestone uh, yesterday, I believe, the twenty uh, third, um, where we marked the twenty fifth anniversary of the release of Batman, the nineteen eighty nine Batman, which you and I discussed the other week. We did. Um, little at length. <laughs> at length, uh, jumping the gun a little bit on the official anniversary, but. Meh. It's, Still crazy to think that that's 25 years old. Um, still a fun movie. It's still a fun movie. It's, um, it's one of the, the those are the kinds of movies, Ghostbusters and Bam. Those are the kind of movies that stand the test of time. You can watch them now and be like, this movie is still awesome to watch. It is. I actually yesterday just uh, perusing Twitter at work, no less. And, on, on, and this is this is gonna make the, the story even better. On the work Twitter accounts, I have, you know, working on Factor 5, it's all car-related, uh, you know, well, most of the things are car-related. I have proper mechanics on there, so you get some random stuff. 
and HP obviously selling computer stuff. But I see something from Rodent Track. Of all places, Rodent Track, you know, celebrating Batman's anniversary and saying why the 1989 Batman movie is the best one. And so I'm reading it, and I find it funny that nowhere does it mention the Batmobile. And you'd think, it being road and track, they exactly. mentioned the Batmobile. Exactly. And they got into like why they thought Michael Keaton was the best Bruce Wayne, better than Christian Bale's, and, and they basically said that Christian Bale's Batman was just too whiny. Um, my parents died, and that just ruins everything. You know, where, you know, Michael Keaton's was more the Joe Cool. Yeah, my parents died, but, you know what, I'm rich. Well, no. well, I mean, it seems like it's like okay, his parents died, and it and it clearly still lingers with him. Right. But it's just like I'm, you know, I'm going to I'm going to avenge my parents. He always comes off like, especially at the beginning there, the party when he first like bumps into Vicky Vale there. Um, he's kind of like, yeah, I'm Bruce Wayne, and you don't know this, but I'm also Batman, which makes me that much more awesome. <laughs> just just so you know. Keep it on the down low. I'm Batman. And just to show you my sensitive side, my parents died. Yep. So I need to know. Some crazy guy killed him. I'm kind of on the hunt. But shh. I'm Batman. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> brace yourself. I'm Batman. <laughs> and just so I know, have you ever seen <coughs> the devil in the pale blue mind? So that's 25 years old. Lots of anniversaries. Um, See, I was dog, actually... Dog is 15 years old. Um, yeah. Everything. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Lion King, I think, is hitting its... Uh, is hitting 20 years. Yep. Yep. Next year will be Toy Story, 20 years old. Yep. It's, uh, it's insane. And... Uh, Meh. There's lots of news about Star Wars going on. Um, since you mentioned Star Wars just a little bit before, uh, talking about how you used to watch Star Wars and Ghostbusters a lot. Yes, um, I did. As I'm assuming everybody knows, at this point, J.J. Abrams is directing Episode 7. Had a little fun with the uh, leaked photos of the Millennium Falcon by posting that little note saying he, he doesn't approve of the leaked photos clearly on the gaming table. From the Millennium Falcon, uh, I, I I think that just makes him even that much more cool for the job because he's having fun with it. And even even though he's like Mister Top Secret with, I mean, look how long well, he tried to keep it. it for people. Yeah. Look how long he tried to keep it secret that Khan was an into darkness. I mean, everybody knew. <laughs> and he goes well, on no, the. See, I appreciate that though. It's, it's he he wants he wants to not spoil any of the fun. Yeah. Yeah. I still like, um, I forget which talk show it was on. I want to say it was like David Letterman or maybe Leno before he retired. Um, but he brought a sneak peek into Into Darkness, and it was just like one second of Spock in the volcano. <laughs> it, was, it was, I like how he had fun with it like that. Um, so everybody knows that. Um, there's been. The news of the spin-offs, the uh, you know, Star Star Wars uh, you know, side movies, which we don't know what they are exactly. People seen their Boba Fett, maybe a Yoda solo movie, maybe a young Han Solo movie. But you got Gareth Edwards doing one. He just did Godzilla, and then I forget the guy who's doing the new Fantastic Four's name. Uh, He did Chronicle. Uh, I would just like to nominate a story that they haven't decided to already do it. They should. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah, that's one of your favorite games. Like, if if anyone anyone out there has played that game, that that one game you could literally break that into three parts and make a trilogy out of that out of that game, and it would be spectacular. So it's Josh Trank who's doing. The other announced uh, Star Wars side movies. Um, 
it'd be interesting to see them if they, they take it, those... Well, because they've kind of said they won't necessarily be pulling from any of the expanded universe and the pre-Disney acquisition of Lucasfilm's expanded universe is going to be kind of considered, you know... Well, they, they consider well, they all the expanding... They consider the expanded stuff non-canon. Yeah. But, I mean, realistically, if they wanted to, if they liked the story enough, there's nothing stopping them from saying, you know what? We'll do it. Come on. Bring it in. You know. But I think... Do it up to them what they want to do. Uh, I know I not to crush your dreams, and anything's still possible. But I think by them doing that, calling it the Legacy Series, and that the only thing that's canon right now is episodes 1 through 6, and then, of course, 7 through 9... And Clone Wars. Mm. But uh, going forward, I think it's just going to be on new stories, which is cool in my opinion. Um, I, I feel like I just my thing is I feel like they'd be they'd be missing out on a good opportunity. But maybe they could do kind of like you know something where they just take like a piece of this story and they build upon that. So they could take like Nazi Old Republic take a generalized version of it and make it work into where they're going. So long as they keep certain elements, you know, you, you, the main character, you got to keep him because, like, that's the whole thing behind it. Right. Uh, and, like, some of the some of the peripheral characters, like the droid in that one, he's, he's like, he's like, CP, he's like C-3PO meets Bender meets a Decepticon. He's like a protocol droid turned into an assassin droid who just hates humans. He's he hilarious. Opens his stomach to get a beer. It would be awesome if he did, but he doesn't need it. Like he gets, for him, drinking beer is just killing something, particularly a human. He or hates was humans, your awesome. Bender reference that he'd be full of wisecracks? I mean, I'm trying to. That's why he, I did the beer. He, thing. he he does have like funny lines like all the time. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's from just him asking people, it's like, so do you want me to kill this guy now? Like, you, you'll meet anybody, and he's like, so can I, can I kill him now? And if you tell him no, he'll be like, that is most disappointing, Master. Hmm. I think Bender has a little bit better wisecracks. Um, well, he, I mean, he does, he's Bender. But, but you got to make it, you know, Star Wars safe. You know, you can't do Bender jokes in Star Wars. It's a little too risque. Exactly. For the, Star Wars scene. Maybe on, like, you know, Star Wars Robot <coughs> Chick you can get away with those jokes. <laughs> Maybe. But not in the movies. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, Gareth Edwards, Josh Trank, J.J. Abrams, all working on Star Wars movies. And then the more recent news, which kind of leads us into our main topic of discussion this episode, is that Ryan Johnson has been announced as the uh, writer and director of Episode 8, and according to this uh, Entertainment Weekly article on the news, uh, he was reported at first as being the writer and director of 8 and 9, but it looks like uh, Episode 9 isn't official quite yet, just a uh, possibility. Mm. Man, they better, cut that. they better cut that shit out. I mean, you... Everything has been a trilogy in this in this series. You can't be like, we're gonna stop at eight. No, no, no. Like they're still saying that episode nine is happening. They're just saying that Ryan Johnson may not oh, be that, he, it. that he's not officially director yet. Yeah. For nine. Okay. Like, like when I first saw the news, no, last week, when it was announced, he's saying, oh, he's doing eight and nine. And then, like I said, uh, this uh, Entertainment Weekly article that was published on June twentieth says eight's a go, and Let's see. Yeah, let's see. Deadline reported that Johnson would also be directing episode nine, but sources tell EW that part of the rumor isn't true, most likely pushed by overzealous agents. Right now, sources close to the films he is only committed to episode eight, but that he will have input naturally in shaping the story for the final installment as any filmmaker involved in the brain trust would. So, it's not saying he is, it's not saying he isn't doing episode 9. The only thing, thing they're saying for sure is he's doing episode 8. Which I don't know how I would feel. Return of the Empire. I mean, 
in the original trilogy, you know, you had Lucas directing episode four. Yep. Um, Irving Kirshner doing the Empire, and then I forget the guy's name who directed Jedi. So you had three different directors, but you always had Lucas writing the story. I think he yeah. helped with the script, and you had other people. Um, uh, Alan Kurtzman, I believe his name is. I might be messing that up. Uh, helping uh, write the actual script for Empire and Jedi, who, and that same guy helped Abrams rewrite the script for uh, Episode Seven here. Um, I, I, and I've, I've heard rumors that like with JJ not directing eight and nine, that he's gonna be kind of the godfather of the series. Like, all right, we're getting things going, and then. I'm going to pass the buck, but I'm going to help keep the story going in the right direction. I've heard that's what J.J. Abrams' role is going to be. Kind of like how he, you know, did Mission Impossible 3, stayed on as a producer for Ghost Protocol, but that was Brad Bird. You know, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be something like that for J.J. for the next two installments after Episode 7. Yeah, I mean... Again, as you as you mentioned, that's what Lucas did. He kind of he kind of stayed in the background, but was but you know kind of like okay, so long as the story's following. This. Not so much in the second trilogy, but definitely in the first trilogy. Should the day come that we uh, cover those? Yeah, man, th- three. I'm gonna have a meltdown when we do episode <laughs> three. And you, you know, you know why. I, this, I th- hopefully this time I will get you to see it. I, I've never I'm seen that. That's, that's um, another story for another day. But, but you must be pleased hearing that uh, episode seven won't be as CG heavy. Obviously, they're definitely going to be using animation to to fill in a lot of stuff that just isn't possible in the uh, real world, even with animatronics and puppetry and everything. We all know there's going to be some level of CG, but J.J. said he is going to scale it back from what we saw in the prequels. Which means they, liking this like a million times over. Yeah. Because, um, incidentally, it's something that we're going to see again in in tonight's feature, is the, the use of practical effects whenever possible. To me, and, and frankly... I mean, Lucas kind of pioneered a lot of this stuff in the original trilogy. Uh, you know, he didn't have CG like he did when he did the the prequel trilogy, so he had to do it, you know, with practical effects. And frankly, they look better. Ah, uh, they do. But sometimes it's also tough to go back. Even just watching, like, the, in Episode Four, watching the Death Star explode, you watch like the original version, and it's cool and all. But then you watch like the special edition version, it's just like that's even cooler, an explosion, you know? Oh, yeah, I mean, there are certain things like adding the big, you know, explosion ring to yeah. the Death Star. That's fine. Yeah, there, are li- there were little things that he added that were fine. And then there, there were some that just sucked. But let's, let's save that. <laughs> I know at some point we're going to get to uh, Star Wars at some let's point. Let's not go down the Sarlacc pit quite yet. Let's save that for another day. I'll save my rants for then, because they're going to be great. They're going to be spectacular rants about this stuff. But, but so, yeah, save them. The big news is uh, Ryan Johnson um, is, is helming at least a Star Wars movie, which uh, leads us to tonight's discussion on Looper, um, which is one of our favorites. Um, Ryan yeah. Johnson also did Brick with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. He um, did the, the Brothers Bloom with Mark Ruffalo, Adrian Brody, and Rachel Weisz, which was a lot of fun. Um, he directed several episodes of Breaking Bad, which, if you haven't seen them, the entire series. But uh, I just watched the last one that uh, Ryan directed um, from season five this evening, uh, Ozzy Mandius, and it's just amazing episode. Like, I just watched that one episode I'm like, I'm hooked. Like, I gotta start from episode one now. Like, I just gotta... <laughs> it's, I watched that one episode, I'm like, I gotta go down this rabbit hole of a journey. Because, I mean... I mean, I remember the general thing of it, especially reading the description. I'm like, alright, which episode is it specifically? 
I remember the plot points, but then I press play and I'm like, it opens up with a flashback to the very first episode, and uh, it just sucks you right into the entire universe. And then just seeing how far he's come and how much he's, how different he is and how different everybody is, and then trying to say this without spoiling anything because I know you haven't seen it. No, I have not. I want to, but I, but I, you know, you know me. I ha- I hate jumping in halfway most of the time. Well, it's over now, and if you just find eight bucks for a month, you could you could polish this off in a month. Just sign up for Netflix for a month just to watch Breaking Bad, and you will not be disappointed. You'll be like, that is eight dollars. Well, just, yeah, yeah, just for streaming, well spent. Um, but man, it just it. it he did a fantastic job, and I can definitely kind of see some of his style. He, he, it's it's kind of cool to say this too, it's like, especially watching that episode of Breaking Bad and then jumping right into Looper. And it's like you can see, even though with Breaking Bad he had to keep it within the look and feel of the TV series as a whole, he still had like some of his own personal touches, as you can you know you can see that. And Looper, you know, oh yeah, he did do this and he did do that. You know, it kind of fits into his world while also staying in the Breaking Bad world. That was pretty cool. Um, but I don't want to spoil Breaking Bad for you. You have to see it. You would love it. Oh, I definitely would. We have little bits. I've caught episodes. I caught actually one of the last few episodes. But it's so, I mean, there's so much of it that you don't understand it, you know, without ke- getting all the context. Yeah. But even, like, that one episode, like, this is awesome. And it's like, I, nah, man, now I have to get into this. Mm-hmm. Son of a bitch. Right. Right. It seems like that's kind of a trend, too, for a lot of TV dramas. It's, I mean, all TV dramas are like this, but it seems like, you know, more so now, at least, maybe it's because it's I'm paying attention, but, like, you know, perfect example, like, a TV drama. If you watch an episode of Law & Order... It's usually contained to just that episode. So if you were to pop in like season five, episode seven, you could watch that episode and enjoy it on its own. Yep. And I feel like you can almost do that with NCIS too. I know NCIS, which I haven't watched too much, has yeah, like, a lot of them are self-contained like that. It still has like overarching storylines that like, they touch upon here and there, but like that episode is you know that mystery is still contained to like that one or two episodes. Yeah. It, but with something like you know. Breaking Bad or Mad Men or something like I'm assuming Lost. I've never seen Lost, but I'm assuming. Walking Dead. Walking Dead, yes. <laughs> um, but I still feel like you could pop in on Walking Dead and catch up pretty quick. <laughs> hmm. They're in a prison. They're running from zombies. And this guy with an eye patch is about to kill everyone. You could catch up pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> But there's also plenty of fill in the blanks, you know. Uh, who's this Shane they keep talking about? Uh, well, who's that guy? Yeah. Wait, wasn't there another guy? Yeah. Who's there? What's his but name? Like, I'm like Breaking Bad and all these shows you just mentioned. You, like you said, you you can jump into the show and you you know you can enjoy it, but like there's so much beforehand. Like, if you don't start from episode one, you really have you don't have the full understanding of what's going on in a given episode. So, definitely would help for me to start from the top. Um, it's really cool that Ryan Johnson was a part of that. We're here to talk about Looper, which I, sounds like is one of your recent favorites. It is. Um, I don't know if it's made its way into your personal top 10 or top 25 even. Um, Maybe I do it, it, it. I do enjoy it, uh, and part of the reason why I enjoy it is, is because if I like a lot of sci-fi movies, kind of like this, that you know don't rely too heavily on uh, on being overly sci-fi, but there's but part but part of the you know central part of the story is something that just defies what we can do you know, what we can do in our world and with our technology. The biggest one, and the one that is, you know, it's so, I like it so much because it's it's so effective and it plays around with story, is time travel. 
the moment you throw nine times out of ten, the moment you throw time travel into something, you've made it more interesting because, I mean, while we can't, you know, we're not Einstein, you know, we can't quite grasp necessarily all the finer points of it, but we know that the moment, you know, people are jumping back into the past, uh, the future that they came from may not exist anymore, and it's completely monkeying around everything, and I love it. And I like the travel monkeys things up. Makes me happy. And I liked in, in Looper how like they touch upon that, but like that wasn't the basis for the story. Like that is Back to the Future. You know that is um, the time machine. You know there's there's countless um, movies and stories using time travel, and that that is the point. You know, look at the the butterfly effect with Ashton Kutcher. It's like same thing. He's like every time he goes to another point in time and changes something, he then goes to another point in time and he sees how that's completely different, how that's altered it, like people's lives and everything. Here, it touches upon that and you see, you know, instances of like, all right, if, you know, if he kills them this time, this is what happens. If he doesn't kill them this time, this is what happens. And they touch upon that a little bit, but it's not the core point of the story. It, in fact... When Joseph, they actually have a scene where Joseph Gordon-Levitt playing young Joe and Bruce playing old Joe sitting there having breakfast with one another, and young Joe is asking old Joe, "Well, if I do this and if this happens, you know, do you remember it? Do you, you know?" Yeah. And, and uh, old Joe's like, "You know what? I didn't come here to talk to you about time travel." He's like, yeah. it, "He's like, if we sit there and start trying to figure out all this stuff, we're gonna be here for hours, and we're gonna be doing diagrams of straws." You know what? Just just let's not even bother trying to ask that question. And I, I love how they, I feel like Joe says some things are fuzzy, some things are crystal clear. You know, so it's kind of like it plays with his memories on the whole time travel aspect, but they don't get too far into it, like you were saying. Precise description of a fuzzy, uh, of like a fuzzy phenomenon or something that is how he described it. Mm -hmm. But but I like how while they're while they're addressing time travel and how it's affecting the characters. Old Joe basically so 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 that the movie doesn't get muddled in the science of it, old Joe basically says, Hey, I'm just a guy, I don't understand half of this crap myself, and if we try to, we're gonna spend all day doing this. So that's their way of being of of being like, hey audience, we know what's we all we'll have a, a concept of time travel. Let's not get too deep into this. It's just gonna confuse everybody. And we're back to the story. Um, but before we jump too far into the events of Looper, uh, one of the aspects that I liked about the advertising was that it got your attention without spoiling too much. Like they basically, the advertising basically focused on the the two Joes, you yeah. know, the, the young Joe and the old Joe, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis, as you mentioned. And that was pretty much how they pitched it. It was just, you know, the, the, the time traveling, uh, how they were using time travel in, in the mob, essentially, to get rid of people. And when they decided, you know, there's people that called loopers who took care of the people that decided they, had, that they were killing off. And they basically focused on that and how, like, eventually when they were done with you, they would send you back in time for you to kill yourself. Yep. <laughs> Go kill yourself. Which is kind of messed up in its of, of itself, but also kind of a cool premise. But that's what the advertising kind of focused on. Now that you've seen the movie and you know more, obviously you know what it's completely about, but like, how would you how would you pitch it to someone who hasn't seen it and not spoil it? Like, would you add a little bit more than what they used in the advertising, or would you keep it kind of mysterious? as they did, and not spill more of the beans, so to speak. Uh, I, will, I if, if it were me, I would kind of try to keep it on the abstract and let people's imagination kind of, you know, run wild. I, 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 I mean, I, I give them the basic premise. It's like, okay, you know, imagine a world where time travel exists. But, and as, as Joe describes it, but because of everyone knows how bad time travel is, it's outlawed. Naturally, the only people who use it are outlaws. 
they send people back to get you know to erase their existence. You're a hit you know you're a hitman who is assigned to kill people who technically don't exist yet. And one day you have to kill yourself. What happens if he screws up? And just let people's imagination play with the idea of now you have a person from the future in the past playing around in a time time period he's not supposed to be in. You know, and just let people play with it. So you don't, would you know, don't sit there and spoil everything. Just let them just let their let their own imaginations play around. So like now we'll get into the spoilers part. So if people, you know, spoiler, spoiler alert. Just to follow the rules, um, you wouldn't mention the telekinetic aspect of it all. You wouldn't mention, nope. you know, Sid and his mom. Nope. And explain like what's going on there at the farm. Cause you still have some of the farm clips in, in the trailer, and you're kind of like, oh, what's going on? And uh, you 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 would keep that hidden. Yeah. I, I... I feel like that's more integral to the the deeper story itself. So it's, I would just let people play around with the premise, and then once you get them trying to the premise, like, oh, and you know what? This is actually going on in here. You know, there's a story going on within this premise. What was your reaction like when you got to that part in the story, and like especially the ending there? Like, what was were, what was your reaction? I want to you know put words in my like. Were you surprised by it? Were you shocked? Were you, you know, were you bored with it? Like, where, where's, were you blown away by your face there? Like, uh, I was, I mean, I, I kind of, uh, you know, when I when I figured out, I mean, it's one, I mean, you get the reveal as to who Sid is, probably about oh, what, two thirds of the way through, let's say, yeah. uh, but. When you at the very end, where you see young Joe, see, you know, seeing the seeing the bad road, just as Abe said to him in the beginning, I, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing the bad ending for you. When when you see Joe's vision of the bad ending, and realize uh, that all the other stuff that you hear about, uh, you know, about the Rainmaker, when you realize how it all fits in, I was just like. Yeah. That's why, and and I always I always enjoy those moments. Yeah, I always yeah. enjoy when it's like, Whoa. you know, when they reveal it's like, oh my god. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's fun with you know the older Joe storyline is like he, you know, obviously the events of you know future thirty years, so so that's twenty seventy four, um, you know. He gets attacked by these three guys, one of which is okay. I, I like to point out how the fashion changes in yeah. the seventies. How they all have like really wide brim hats and like big long trench coats. It's funny seeing uh, the change in fashion. Well, that's the time periods. We'll jump back to what I, I was going to say in a minute. One, but I was watching this time and all the times. I really dig how they're jumping 30 years in the future here and when it came out last year, so it's 31, whatever. 30 years in the future. And it's a 30 years into the future that you could buy as being 2044. Like, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character uh, as, as young Joe is, is driving around in a Miata. They, and, well, what would be a, considered a classic car by that point Yeah. Yeah, is it, it, this really, really spiffy-looking Miata. It actually makes it a manly car for once. Yeah, and, and you... You look at the cars that's passing that are parked along the street or broken the broken down school bus, and you're like, oh, those look like it's it's a used car lot. You yeah. know, it, it's not like jumping into uh, Back to the Future Two when he goes to 2015. Remember, people, 30. You know, he goes to 2015, not 2013 or 2014. <laughs> Don't believe the myths online. It's 2015. <laughs> uh, uh. Uh, but you know, you know, he goes from the 80s to the to 2015, and it's you know night and day. Like, oh, uh, definitely. You no. Know? Yeah, there's a the the some that controls the weather. Yeah. Um, flying cars, all this stuff. No, oh, and they just look futuristic. And I mean, you know, the, the hoverboards, which everybody still wants the hoverboard. Um, everything just looks, you know, crazy in the future where 
here, you're going into 30 years where you could be like, all right, that probably isn't what it's going to look like, but, but it's believable. It works. You know, they, I like how the the most futuristic thing they have is the hover cycle. Yeah, exactly. But, it's a, but because it's like the first model of it, it's a piece of shit. Right. <laughs> no right. one can get the damn thing started. Like, come on, you piece of shit. And it's like that. If we ever get that sort of technology, it's not going to be like this. You know, suddenly, you know, like the Jetsons. It's going to be like that, where like, okay, we have it, but the bugs have not been worked out at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it uh, it looks like the only other thing that changed is like they went from paper money to the silver and gold bars. Well, they actually do have paper money, if you notice. I didn't notice that, but that all the loopers are exchanging their uh, silver for rolls of red dollar bills with Mao's face on them. Hmm. Which I thought was interesting. That's, that's the other thing about that, is that it, it's a sort of, a kind of a bleak looking future. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm assuming, because it's set in Kansas, I'm assuming that the city that he's in has got to be, uh, my guess would be like Topeka or something. Right. But like, there's roving this whole like sections that look like Detroit. I mean, they it's just just streets are lined with uh, with homeless people in burnt out hulks of cars, uh, and I and then you 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 see some of the other neighborhoods. They look normal, but you go deeper into the city and it looks it looks like it's been through a war. Right. And that's that's it's what very mm. like. You have a lot of these futuristic movies um, and stories because they're usually based on a book. Um, but like the Hunger Games takes place sometime in the future, but it's like an extreme where you have like the, the, the city and then the you know the completely poor districts on the opposite side. Yeah. You know, it, you know, same thing looks like is the case with Divergent and you know a lot of these you know young adult I guess sci-fi movies. It looks like they're not making, you know, they're making it look like it's, you know, anywhere in the galaxy, yeah. but it's not like Star Wars or Star Trek futuristic, but it's not quite as believable of a, you know, 30 years in the future as Looper is, you know, it's kind of in that gray area between the two types of futures. Uh, something else that you see, uh, if you look at all the cars, almost all of them, have some sort of um, recycling system, converting their exhaust back into fuel. Uh, and you see a lot of cars. And if you notice, all the cars, um, which I suppose it makes sense, seeing how they're just working with the cars that they have, you know, the cars that they have access to, you know. But uh, in story, all the cars are all, like, from now, which makes them, like, junkers. They're, like, old, you know, rust buckets by the, the time of the movie, and you see they all have, like, kind of beat-up old solar panels on them. Yep. Uh, you know, clearly, like, it was ex it was experimented with at one time to sit there and be like, oh, we'll have them all run on solar power, but it didn't quite work out. So it's, it's funny seeing, like, technology's kind of like, okay, yeah, technology's gone up a little bit. The phone is like a little pane of glass, but... Again, it's not like this super, uh, like, ultra-futuristic Jetsons future that so many other sci-fi movies that have come before it so often portray the future as. Sure. I definitely agree with that. Um, but what I was, I was getting at two or four with uh, older Joe was I, I really dig his, his storyline. His storyline is just, uh, it's, it's one of revenge, and he's found this loophole of time travel to get revenge at the people who kill his wife and eventually prevent it. And I was like, well, if I stop him, I can have my happy ending 30 years from now because they won't be there to kill her as, as they're trying to kill him. It was and obviously, you know, it wasn't their goal to kill her, but the result of it. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, you can clearly see that the guy who shot him was kind of, he's kind of the rookie of that uh, hit squad. Yeah. And but, he got um, messed up. Yeah, I, I just I you know I like 
working in that revenge story that way and like it gave it a different twist that you don't with with that type of revenge story like you know you killed my wife you know instead of the traditional way of doing it they, they use this time travel and like I, I I dig that version of the story and like that's why he's he goes to the library he pulls up the map he finds where the three people are he's like right I'm gonna go kill those kids I thought and then when he sees uh Susie and seeing that. Oh, it's one of her. It's her son. It's one of them. And just the emotion that rushes to his face. I was like, oh. It, there's a couple of. Uh, it's actually an interesting dynamic. Uh, in reference to Joe's mission, that I, I kind of like seeing, but I'll I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, one of the things that I really did enjoy, though is right at the part where Joe is trying, or young Joe is trying to escape uh, the Gatman, who initially, you don't initially realize, while, yeah, they're essentially a, a gang, they're the muscle for Abe, them and Abe, they're the cops. Right. You, you, you know, you don't, they, they don't, they don't actually say it directly until much later. You actually see them driving around in police cars, and you're like, holy and shit, those guys are the cops. Uh, but when he when Joe is trying to escape them, as he's crashing into the car, you know, as he's you know falling from the fire escape, crashes onto a car, it everything stops, and it kind of goes back, and it shows you the world that old Joe comes from, right? Where he kills himself and right. becomes old Joe, which. Uh, and you and showing him like in Shanghai, I thought was very cool. Yeah, especially because they uh, when he's talking to Abe, Abe's like, "You're gonna end up in Shanghai. I'm from the future. I know where you're going." He's like, "No, I'm learning French. I'm going to I'm going to Paris. You're like, going to Shanghai. I know. <laughs> I'm from the future. You're go you you don't go to France. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I thought and just a, a side note here. I I mean I definitely think it's it's commonplace now. I feel. In Hollywood, um, it kind of always has been, but uh, you know, it's, it's cool to see Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Jeff Daniels team up again after uh, the Lookout a few years back, which was another. I don't know if you've seen the Lookout. It's definitely not. I haven't yet. Kind of up your alley. Um, but I, I don't know if it was just luck of casting that they got to work together again, or if, you know, Joseph Gordon-Levitt was like, you know, who'd be perfect for Abe, Jeff. Jeff Daniels. Uh -huh. I don't know what the situation was there, but I, I, I thought it was cool that they worked together again after the lookout. Um, oh. But yeah, you think you like that dynamic of switching between, you know, between the point of view of young Joe to older Joe, and well, seeing, so seeing where that old, awesome. seeing where that old Joe came from. Yeah. Because in his, in the timeline he came from, he does kill himself. Which really kind of that's that's where your head starts getting wrapped around this whole concept of time travel. It's like, wait a minute, old Joe is coming from a world where he killed himself, but now he doesn't kill himself, and, and it takes you all through his little his his future history in in Shanghai, where he becomes a a, a soldier for the Triads. Uh, he gets found out by the Rainmaker, gets sent back. Um, and then, you know, in presumably in his original world, assuming that he still marries his wife, she doesn't get killed in his original world. Or maybe he doesn't meet her in his original world. But uh, in this one, because of what happened to her, he, rather than, you know, just accept his fate, he basically decides, oh, these guys up, kills all of his uh, would-be... Uh, you know, his, his would-be captures, sends himself into the past, and basically decides, okay, I have to completely change the world that I'm, that I'm coming from. Which then gets me on to my other, uh, the other thing I was going to say. When old Joe and young Joe are having breakfast, old Joe is sitting there criticizing his younger self for being, uh, you know, for being a junkie for being a killer, for being selfish. 
but by the end of the movie, uh, it's young Joe who's kind of looking at old Joe's like, he's like, who's like, look at you, because old young Joe has now gotten uh, has gotten clean from heroin, so he's not a junkie anymore. Old Joe has been going around killing children, uh, and doing so essentially for what what young Joe now realizes is essentially a rather selfish motivation. He's doing it to protect what, as young Joe put it, protect what he has. Young Joe now decides, oh, wait a minute. There's more to this than, you know, protecting what I have. So we're kind of seeing a role reversal where it's old Joe who now becomes the selfish killer and young Joe who is kind of criticizing himself for the error of his ways. And I, I kind of like how they kind of flip that around by the end of the movie. Yeah, definitely. That's that a good point. I know, and I definitely like the end of the movie just, just for the simple fact when he finally, Young Joe finally puts it together like the only way to stop it is to turn the gun on himself. I mean, he's basically saying, if I don't exist, older Joe doesn't exist. And, and that's the only exist. way to truly end my loop. So, which uh, makes complete sense. And it's something like, even you as a viewer, even as you're seeing all these, you know, you know, young Joe killing random guys, not even when he gets faced with himself, but all these other young guys, he's like, you know, he killed all these older guys 30 years from now, but the younger version still exists, so what's going to prevent the loop from just continually happening and, you know, you're never truly dead in that sense until Joe Your loop is closed. Yeah. and finally figured out this is the only way to truly end your loop. Which I thought was another good um, aspect of the story. There was, a, there was another part where um, where it shows why, it shows what um, what you know? What gives old Joe kind of the motivation to go back is the the idea of finding you know the new super boss, the Rainmaker. Mm -hmm. And and you see one of his other uh, fellow ex loopers who hasn't been sent back by that point. Um, where he's he, he's in the middle of apparently some sort of war zone giving Joe the information as to when the Rainmaker was born and uh, what the zip code was. And uh, and, and Joe's, as Joe's, you know, recounting this to young Joe, he's sitting there saying, well, th this is the only piece of information that we have on him. It's like, well, do you know who he is? Do you know what he looks like? It's like, we don't, I don't know if I'm calling, it, calling him a he, but, you know, I don't even know if it is a he. Only you know, you know, there's all sorts of crazy rumors about him. They say that he watched his, his mother get killed in front of him. They say he's got a synthetic jaw. And what's funny is at the end, as you as you are as you and Young Joe are watching his vision of the bad ending for Sid, you see him yeah. there holding a rag over the gunshot wound on his cheek after just watching old Joe murder his mother and it's like, holy shit. You see how all those rumors, they really are true. You see yeah. where he's going to have a synthetic jaw. You see where he's watched his mother die. It's like, holy shit. All of those little tiny rumors, little tidbits you get about him are real, yeah. which so I like. Sounds, I, I sounds appreciate like, that. Sounds to me like you enjoyed the uh, time travel aspect of the movie much more than the telekinesis aspect of the movie. Um you know, obviously Emily Blunt's Sarah um, and Sid, played by Pierce Gagnon. I'm assuming this is one of his first roles, if not his. Definitely um, Paul Dano's character, Seth. Paul Dano always ends up playing that type of character. <laughs> I mean, especially, I, mean, I can think of another movie off the top of my head, uh, Cowboys and Aliens. He was kind of a very similar character. Um... Well, it's definitely different in Little Sunshine. He's different in Girl Next Door. Uh, there will be blood. He's the crazy 
guy <laughs> where you see like he's serious off for the person, then he goes crazy once he's in church. But you know, yeah. I, this is at least my the second movie where he's like he wants to be, like, especially like in that instance where you were mentioning where the, the broken down motorcycle. He's like, don't touch my motorcycle! Don't touch my car! Oh, hey Joe, how's it going, man? <laughs> <laughs> I love that he's in there you know, getting pissed <laughs> off with him. It's like, oh, hey, Joe. But um, you know, he, you know, he's another character that you know he's floating the uh, coin, coin around. Uh, so you see, he has TK. So you know, Emily Blunt. So one of the other loopers, actually. You know, um, it, but it it sounds like you know, the, the TK was just a plot point and nothing nothing too exciting for you in the movie. Is that true? Well, I mean, you don't. You don't see much of the, the telekinetic stuff until much uh, until you really get introduced to Sid because right. all all anyone else can do you know they're floating around coins and shit and it's, uh, and the way Joe describes it and I think this is actually this is intentional I think on Ryan Johnson's part um you know the way it's described is it, it's really just kind of like a meh he I think he intentionally downplays yeah. it. So that when you see Sid, you realize that you know while everyone else is just you know as 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 Joe says, just douchebags floating coins. Uh, when you introduce to Sid and his real power, yeah, you realize this this kid is someone not to mess with. Basically, I learned do not argue with him that eight times three equals thirty-two. That's basically what I learned. I love that scene. <laughs> she's like, okay, count out the eights, and he's like, eight, sixteen, and you can see he's thinking about it, thirty-two. Yeah. And then she's like, um, I'm gonna run into my safe right now. You scream it out, <laughs> and I'll, I'll come out in like an hour or so when you've cooled off a little bit. I I remember watching that scene in the theater, and initially I'm sitting there watching, and I'm just like, why is she? It just seems, I mean, I imagine everyone was watching that going, why is she going into the safe? Right. Uh, because, he, once again, they, they, they make a point of not really showing it until yeah, Jesse they, shows up. They basically make it look like he's just, like, losing his temper to the extreme. Yeah. And, like, it just looks like she's going to hide, but and you don't really see that he's going to, you know, basically destroy the house. But it's definitely, like, the first time you watch it, a little confusing until you see him... You know, scream at the the guy, and you know they're running out of the house <laughs> and blows him to smithereens. Yeah, um, they get a true sense of his uh, his powers, but it is one of those fun things that makes it the movie rewatchable. Is all these elements we're talking about that you go back and you know, you pick up on those little details that they hinted at before. So. But uh, again, uh, you're you're saying your your view of uh, just using the telekinetic as a, a plot point. Uh, you liked that they kept it till the second half of the movie. And yeah, I, I, I like I like kind of the the downplaying the sort of the, the sort of misdirection about TK's to make it seem like it's not that big of a deal. So that when you see Sid and and you realize just how powerful he is, you realize that yes, everyone else who you've seen with this is not a big deal. Yeah. This is a big deal. Where he's literally like lifting up everything in the room, blows a guy to smithereens, uh, and then the second time around with old Joe, where he literally lifts up like everything within like a what, like a mile radius of him? Something like that. And he's ready to just go completely bonkers on old Joe. Uh, it 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 made um it made all the, the it made all the previous stuff uh, just pale in comparison, and I, and I like that because I mean, with something like that you don't want to you don't want to you know show too much too early. Right. Uh, on the other hand, with the uh, with the the time travel aspect, I, I always and I, I like this with a lot of things that play around with the idea of time is this notion of seeing how one thing creates something else, how, like, the loop continues. Because when you see, uh, 
I don't know what I don't know what the what his name was. He was the guy. He was in. Uh, he was one of the prisoners on The Walking Dead. Rick macheted him in the in the face. Can't remember uh, what his character yeah. name was. Uh, I'm assuming it's his older self. You know, when he's sitting there telling Joe and, he, and and Joe's recounting all these little rumors. These are like little throwaway details about the Rainmaker that even Joe doesn't believe are real. But when you find out just how how accurate they are, I enjoy uh, I enjoy seeing that part of the reason why I, I mean Joe in coming back has made those rumors accurate. Yeah. Uh, you must be talking about uh, Nick Gomez. Idea. Nick Gomez was in uh, Walking Dead, and he played uh, Dale, oddly enough, here in, uh, in Looper. I don't think, man, that must be the guy you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's his older self that's the one who warns Joe, uh, you know, gives Joe the information on, on where the Rainmaker was born and on what day. <coughs> right. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's I always enjoy uh, those aspects of of any time travel story, where kind of it's like with the Terminator. The very fact that the Terminator comes back to kill Sarah Connor is the reason why John Connor is born in the first place. Sure. And, and Joe is essentially the Terminator, sent back to kill a kid to prevent him from becoming something terrible in the future, or at least terrible from his perspective. Uh. And in the very act of coming back, creates the very thing that he's come back to destroy. Um, was it a satisfying ending for you, where it's just you know, like you said, young Joe figures out how to stop it, how to protect uh, Sid and uh, Sarah, and then it kind of you know shows that you know she's taking care of Sid, and that uh, Joe has a treat for them with all the money he's left them. <laughs> Accidentally. Uh, was that a satisfying ending for you to this story, or did you hope for a little bit more, even if it's just a little bit more of like a PS, like, you know, what, what was your thoughts on the ending? Um, I'm sure, I, I imagine, uh, to a certain degree, it's, it's human nature to want uh, a happy ending for the protagonist, you know, because you could clearly you could clearly see that uh, there's actually even a scene where Joe is or old Joe is fighting to remember his wife's face. You can clearly see like where Sarah is seems to be overwriting that memory implies that there could have hypothetically been a future, a future Joe where instead of marrying his wife in Shanghai, he marries Sarah. You know, as, you're, you're, yeah. as Joe said, there's a lot of his memories become fuzzier, clear, depend on how much more likely they become. And you could, and you could also tell that Joe's, old Joe's actions were changing the future that he was coming from. So I'm, So there's always a part of me that's kind of that kind of hopes, you know, even though I know how the ending goes, there's always a part of me that kind of, that kind of wishes there was a scenario where Joe didn't have to uh, kill himself and he could have that future with Sarah kind of being Sid's father. But at the same time, uh, you know, as I said before, this is kind of a, a slightly bleak world to begin with. Yeah. So you, so you can't necessarily expect that the ending won't be a little bleak in and of itself. Well, and just like I was saying before, by having young Joe kill himself and truly ending the loop, it, it brings some sort of fin finality to the story where it's like... Because if, if they left it with young Joe gets rid of old Joe, and then he, like you're saying, he goes in you know, this timeline, he goes and lives with Sarah and Sid, you know... And if they hit credits then, then the viewer is left with, well, what happens 30 years from now when he decides, or when he gets sent back to see young Joe once again? Like, you're in another loop. But, so, but, but hypothetically, uh, 
hypothetically, he doesn't get sent back. Because of the Rainmaker who's making a point of getting rid of all the loopers. It's true. So if the Rainmaker doesn't exist anymore, at least not in that sense... No, but I'm saying he's... The Rainmaker be, being Sid... Yes. He's still living... He's living with Sid. Yes. That's my point. So if... if like the, the, the happy ending that you're mentioning that would be people would be looking for would be young Joe kills old Joe and saves Sarah and Sid and they go with you know presumably happy ever after. Yes. If they hit credits, then you the viewer doesn't know. Maybe Sid still turns bad, you know, and the events still play out somehow. You know, like I've been saying this like a bunch whenever I talk to people about Star Trek Into Darkness and I hear everybody who complained about it and con and everything. The thing I liked and you know how they you know, mirrored a lot of things from Wrath of Khan. Was, you know, my point was, that's the beauty of the alternate timeline that the new Star Trek is following, because Into Darkness says, we're in an alternate timeline, but these events still happen. Someone's still going to say it's Khan. You know, someone's, someone's still gonna, going to die, you know, just differently. So it's the same thing. It's like, you can be in this whole new timeline where instead of going to, Shanghai and meeting that you know that girl. Joe's with Sarah and Sid, but Sid could still turn bad, and you'd still have to be in another loop. Where young Joe killing himself truly ends his loop, no question about it. True, but uh, but I, I the way, or at least how I'm how I'm imagining it. I mean, the reason why Sid turns bad is because he watches his mother get killed in front of him. Where that doesn't happen anymore, the chances of him turning bad, like he's, he's embraced his mother again, his, and his mother didn't die. Which seems to be the, the thing that, because if you see Joe's, uh, young Joe's, you know, bad ending for Sid, that's what sets him on his road. But that's he feels like, that he yeah, feels that he, he mother to become lived. powerful because he watched his mother die. Uh, but yeah, I'm thinking that, that, that too. Happen, I'm saying, you know, Anakin still would have become Darth Vader, so Sid still could come back. You know. Maybe. Uh, I'm just to me logically, it, the likelihood is much less than what it was. Uh, from the original world that old Joe came saying, from. If, 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 if you had that happy ending, though, like it's still... It feels like there's more unanswered questions than by having the not-so-happy ending. That we have. I mean, you could view it as a happy ending, that by him sacrificing himself, he is letting mother and son live happily ever after. No, I, 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 I guess, have, like I said... happy ending, you know. The, uh, you know, com what I would consider a complete happy ending for Joe and for everyone else, um, wouldn't necessarily, I mean, to me, it's like, it almost wouldn't fit the movie to a certain degree. No. Like I said, it, it, you know, the, the, wor the world that this movie is set in is itself somewhat bleak, so I can't, it's kind of like The Departed. You can't necessarily expect, you know, uh, a perfect happy ending for everybody. No, no. I agree. I just, you know, like I say, especially with the use of time travel and, it's in the, as the story device, it's just, you know, the why, are endless, you know. That's why I love time travel stories. Yeah. It's a, they can go off in a million different directions. Um, watching this movie, it's, it's, I think it's a real um, testament to just how great of an actor Joseph. Gordon Levitt is because of, of course he had um, and, and and there's some documentaries on the, at least on the Blu-ray that show this but uh, he did have some prosthetics and uh, makeup on to make him look more like Willis esque. Um, obviously, still looks like Joseph Gordon Levitt too. But um, if, if you watch closely, he got some of the mannerisms and uh, facial expressions of Willis down to a T. There's a couple times where he shoots people a look. That's he does straight he does, out of Bruce. He does his head turn quite well, and he's got the eyes squinted right, and he's just like, "What are you doing?" Um, 
there's a, there's I uh, can't remember what prompted it. I think it's when he's first when he first meets up with Kid Blue and he's and he kind of points his gun at him and 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 Young Joe shoots him that look. Yeah. And it's like that's Bruce's look, and I love it. Yeah. I love it, and that he made a point of getting down those mannerisms. Yeah, it was. Just, I think that's the, that was for me the, the cherry on the cake that really cemented that like, all right, this could be Young Joe is because you know. And I think that just made Bruce Willis' job easier because he's even he just had to be himself and yeah and I really really just it's kind of interesting that like Joseph Gordon-Levitt is obviously the main the main character like he's the main Joe and Bruce Willis is his supporting character but uh, yeah I, I just loved I mean I love Joseph Gordon-Levitt's performance in almost everything I've I've seen him in from uh. Angels in the Outfield to uh, we've always talked about 500 Days of Summer um, a little while ago. Um, it'll be cool to see him in Sin City this coming summer. Uh, yeah. I bet. I, I like the idea of him in Sin City. Yeah. Um, but I think I think this is just one of his best performances because he carry obviously carries the movie, but to the, the icing on the cake, as I said before, was just him really uh, adding in those. Bruce Willis expressions that really ties the two versions of the character together. Yeah, I mean because he can't he can't necessarily sound like Bruce, but he but he does such a good job of of truly I mean not pretending to be Bruce of really emulating just the little things about yeah. him. But he also like adds that little bit extra rasp to his voice, particularly yeah. listening like. It sounds like Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but it's also believable to just be like, all right, this is the young version of his voice, and that's the older version of his voice, just like any human goes through that maturing of their voice. You know? It it it, it wasn't, like, perfect, you know, without, you know, this is his doppelganger, you know, this is <laughs> younger, his true younger self. But... This is probably as close as you could possibly get between two actors who are not related. Yes, that is quite true. Um, so I, I think to wrap this up, uh, we've discussed this quite thoroughly. Um, it's definitely one of our favorites. It's up there in mine. I don't know where it ranks with you. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite movies of the, of the last five years, I'd say. Years, yeah. I think it's definitely one of the best sci-fi movies. Um, it's, it's right up there with like District Nine with giving us something fresh. Um, yeah. Especially you know sci-fi movies are kind of falling into the you know the franchises like we mentioned Star Wars and Star Trek. Um, you got everything with Marvel going on, which is superhero sci-fi. Um, you know Prometheus was a cool movie, but it's part of the Alien franchise. You know, so you have you're we're in a world of that type of storytelling where it's, it's refreshing to have stuff like Looper and District 9 give us some originality, which they even reference in the movie. Jeff Daniels Abe says, <laughs> when he's commenting on Joe's tie, he goes, dude, you know, you're like an old movie. You know, you're like movies say, all you're doing is rehashing old trends. Like, <laughs> you, you, know, you know the movies that you're imitating are just imitating on the movies. Yeah. I like how he... Put a subtle, well, not so subtle because it's, it's quite direct, but still, he worked in that little dig, um, without being mean about it. You know, it was a, it was a nice little touch on a uh, Ryan's uh, screenwriting, which I think you know, watching this movie, especially, I mean, I, I enjoy Brick. I think we watched Brick at an uh, an old movie night. Um, we all had, if I remember correctly, um, which I is a, might not have been there for that one. Yeah. Which is a cool. Uh, I think I, maybe we didn't watch. I know I brought it over at least as a suggestion. It's a cool. Uh, you know. It, it's it's definitely a, a film noir, a modern film noir, obviously because it's a o four o five. Um, a, a super dark teen high school. You know where Veronica Mars. One of my. You know obviously I'm a because of the movie and everything. I've been in a. Veronica Myers mode for the past few months, but uh, where that's like, you know, 
typical happy, well, not happy bubbly, but typical teen noir type stuff. Brooke goes completely dark. <laughs> and uh, I think Amanda Seyfried might be in that. Veronica Mars is awesome. I don't mean to say, I mean, they call it teen, a teen noir is a bad thing. Like that. Um, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> but. I figured you, my, you would have My version, my, my version uh, saying you that, that one. You know, you know, Veronica Mars is like watching a comedy compared to watching Brick. <laughs> oh, well. And that's that's not even including the then just the natural humor that they put into Veronica Mars. Like, Brick is dark. <laughs> <laughs> wicked dark. <laughs> the lobster said in, in Nemo, and it's like wicked dark down there. It, it's dark. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I'm very excited to see what Ryan Johnson <laughs> does with sci-fi, because we've seen what he's done with these, you know, I mean... We've seen this version of sci-fi. It'll be interesting seeing what he does with a like, Star Wars type sci-fi with Episode Eight. And uh, so long as we have a good lightsaber fight, and I'm kind of hoping for a reveal. You know, I, I feel like I almost feel like a trilogy isn't quite complete if there isn't some kind of like reveal. I mean, nothing can ever quite be. Luke, I am your father. Right. But or Leia is your sister, so you made up with your sister. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Well, actually, uh, to kind of bring things back around again, if they did do a Knights of the Old Republic movie, there would be that kind of Luke, I am your father level of reveal. Fair At enough. Least the people who hadn't played the game. Right. There'd definitely be. <sighs> I think they've got maybe it'll be in episode seven here. Um, they'll have some surprises for us, you know, stuff that we won't necessarily be anticipating from, you know, acts one and two. You know, they'll have some sort of twist in act three to lead into episode eight. But you're right; it would be cool to have that that moment in episode eight that is similar to Empire's yeah. Luke and your father. I agree. I don't think, especially in the Star Wars universe, you definitely can't have something, and especially in today's universe, where it's like, you know, everybody knew that it was going to be Khan and Into Darkness. You know, everybody, you know, things are leaked so quick, quickly now, and it's so tough to keep everything hush hush throughout production and advert, you know, promotions. That um, I don't know if it would necessarily be as shocking as when Empire was released in 1980. Um, so well, hopefully they have some sort of twist like that in episode eight, and I'm sure Ryan's got something in his in his mind for it. Um, I'm saying that like I know the guy. I don't at all. <laughs> Me and him, we're like <laughs> we're so close. You don't even know. You don't even know. Um, but yeah, we're definitely looking forward to it. We both enjoy Looper. No question there. Um, and I think that will wrap up this episode. Um, once again, I'm your host, Dave Lindsay. I'm Liam Laird. Have a good one, folks. What up? A-